Welcome everybody to the Dreaming Out Loud um, the food business workshop series. Uh, we're gonna wait just a few minutes to let some people come in and then we'll get started. There we go. We always have people trickle in after, right after. All right, I'm just gonna wait two more minutes to 3.05 and then I will get started. Thank you so much for coming, especially at uh, 3 p.m. on a Thursday. I know it's sometimes very difficult for people to attend. Um, that's why these webinars are all uh, recorded. So you will be able to, to catch them online. So just hold on for like two more minutes and then we'll get started. Thank you for waiting. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, I am going to go and just begin the presentation. Um, I am Carolina Gomez, and I work with food businesses. I work primarily with, well, my company is called foodbizmentor.com, um, but we also, I work with the Small Business Development Center, with this food business incubator called Dreaming Out Loud, and with the Carlos Rosario Public Charter School and with Crossroads in uh, Tacoma Park. So why do I do this? Um, I really believe, and especially like the name of this program, it's called Dreaming Out Loud. I really do believe that you have so much power when you're opening a food business or just a business in general. Um, my trajectory in food business has been... Um, I mean, I've, I've loved business since I was very little. A lot of people look at me as a chef because I'm a chef. I'm a trained chef. I went to the Culinary Institute of America. The um, All of the things that I enjoy doing have to do with food. And I started 
really young understanding about business because my parents are both small business owners. Uh, my father's a general contractor here in Washington, D.C., and I was just always around business. And so really, as much as I love food and it's like probably it's my biggest passion and it's an outlet for me. I love business and I love business because it breeds opportunity. It gives opportunity not only to you, the opportunity, the entrepreneur, but it gives opportunity to everyone that you're employing. Um, and it allows you the power to create a really great safe space for people. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to go right into the presentation and introduce to you a little bit about Dreaming Out Loud and our partners. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So actually, let me click here. There we go. All right, it always takes a little bit for me to share my screen. But I am going to go ahead and share my screen and tell you a little bit about the Dreaming Out Loud program. I noticed that the participants here today are, I don't think I've met you before in this program. I think I've met you through other places and then you heard about this program. Um, and hopefully more people sign up moving forward as well because this is gonna be a really fun workshop and it's a series of workshops. So uh, just as we said before in the chat, if you have not registered in the Eventbrite link, and if you're just you you came here through the email that I sent, please register through the Eventbrite link because then you can see all of the different um, all of the different classes that we have coming up, and I'll kind of go over that at the end of this presentation. But this is Dreaming Out Loud. Dreaming Out Loud is a beautiful organization. I started working with Dreaming Out Loud about uh, six years ago at a business, um, they, they were doing these same business classes in person at Martha's Table. And we had about 11 businesses that we were helping back then. And since then, this whole cohort has grown. And we are so happy to start this up again because we did stop a little bit during COVID and to be able to relaunch and restart helping supporting businesses is a, um, it's a it's exciting. It's very exciting because we want to make sure that we're giving you the resources that you need in order to open your businesses. So if you do have a business already, hopefully this helps you exercise some thoughts about uh, how you you know move forward with your business, um, or if you even want to revamp your business plan. And if you don't have a food business already, then I'm going to go over what is a thought process you should have as you open your food business. And this is only the first workshop. Tomorrow we have another one at 3 p.m. at the same time. And that's gonna be where we go over developing a proof of concept. Um, developing a proof of concept is an extremely important part of understanding if a business is viable, if your food business is viable. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, talk a little bit about the Nourish DC Collaborative. Um, there is a grant that is going to um, open up in late October, and we will post it on the, the Nourish DC website once the exact date is determined. But in 2021, Nourish DC granted a total of $530,000 to 10 DC food businesses in wards five, seven, and eight. Um, in 2022, Nourish DC granted, uh, the grant pool is $500,000. So for 2022, which is right now this year, the grant pool is $500,000. And the grants will range from $10,000 to $50,000. And this is all um, a something that is a collaboration between um, Capital One and Nourish DC. Uh, Dreaming Out Loud is, we're so happy to be able to host you business owners to be able to hopefully apply and grant and, and win one of these grants. Um, this is something that 
people have been asking for also for a long time. So if you need help in applying for a grant, Nourish DC includes technical assistance, um, and so does the DCSBDC, and so do we here at Dreaming Out Loud. So just let us know if you need help to apply for a grant. Um, this is a big opportunity. The, we have not had that many of these grants go out this year, so I'm really happy you're here so you can learn about it. Also, once you register, I will be able to sh send you these um, these presentations because you should have access to these because we have the information there. Um, I'm also going to put into the chat these two really important links. Um, this first link that I'm sharing with you is the, um, hold on one second, because I'm just trying to copy paste it. Oh. Well, it looks like I can't copy paste it, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that from my email address. Um, but the first uh, link that I'm sharing with you right here is the Nourish DC website. The grant application is going to open in late October. Um, the exact date is not determined yet, and it will be posted on this website that I'm putting in the chat right here. Um, so I'm going to send it to all of you. That's one link. That's where the grant will be posted. So you want to make sure that you follow that link. And if you want updates on future grants, grants in the future, which you always want to see, you always want to know what's going on um, for grants in DC, um, I will share this link. This link is, it'll give you updates on future grants. This is the Capital Impact website. The Sorry, I was just copy pasting. So that's why I look like I'm looking at something else because I was looking at a different screen. So there you go. Hopefully this is helpful for everybody. Um, and you will, if you don't, um, if you lose this information, just email me. I'll also put my email in the chat here. Um, I spent a few uh, days traveling this week. So if you've emailed me between within the last week, Sorry, I have um, been a little bit behind on my emails, but now I'm back and I'm not going anywhere. So I will be able to, to be more responsive. But my email is carolina at foodbizmentor.com. So if you lose any of this information, no worries. Just, just let me know um, that you need it and then I will reshare it with you. Um, so now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, different programs that are available. Um, let me share my screen again. And then I'm gonna talk about opening a food business, which is what you're here to listen about today. Perfect. But now you know a little bit about me. I spoke to you about me. A few of you I've, I see already know, um, you already know me. And I've been working with uh, food business incubators since I started uh, Food Biz Mentor. And Food Biz Mentor is my company. And the reason I opened Food Biz Mentor was really because as a business owner of a deli and charcuterie on Georgia Avenue in DC, I realized that um, food business owners need support. And I've been there and I do that. I'm still a chef. I, I actively am a chef still. And it's not the easiest of businesses. And I think that it is um, a beautiful business. It's something that you have the potential to grow. It's just that you need the right strategy in which to do it. So that's why we're here uh, to help you. But before you apply for the grant, just keep it in mind. But before you apply, just remember that to be eligible for the Nourish DC grant, a business must have a food business that grows, processes, and distributes and or sells food products or processes and sells agricultural inputs for production. Um, you must be physically located in the District of Columbia. Um, preferences is for businesses located in five, in wards five, seven, and eight. Um, but you must be located in DC. You must be in business and generating revenue for more than six than six months. So the next um, 
the next class that we're going to do in this cohort, so tomorrow at 3 p.m., we're going to talk about developing a proof of concept. That's where this uh, criteria fits in. So if you do not already have an active food business in Washington, D.C., don't worry, because these grants do happen on every, you know, they, they happen repetitively. It's not like it's once and done. So if you haven't necessarily hit that requirement yet, the, the best thing that you could that is happening to you right now is that you're learning about it and you're learning about it. So now you can also work for it for, for next year or for the next time. And that's why we're here to help you through the technical assistance. And then you must have earned more than $10,000 of revenue in the past 12 months. You should be an active business. Today's workshop is um, how to open a food business in DC, but some of you have uh, businesses already, so it's good to know. And this is why the proof of concept will be really important. Um, and then last point is that there will also be an additional round of funding launched in the spring specifically focused on funding cold storage and refrigeration. That is a big deal, actually. Um, I can't tell you how many people really need more cold storage, and it is pretty expensive. I mean, a walk-in fridge is about $10,000, um, and if you need to replace something, um, that's pretty great. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, and if you're facing difficulties with your equipment, again, we're here at the DCSBDC. We're trying to help you. So just mention if you're facing any troubles. It doesn't matter if it's not technical business type troubles, if it's equipment, if it's whatever has to do with your business, we're here to help. So just let us know so we can connect you with the right resources. But this is excellent. And I'm so grateful um, to Capital One, Dreaming Out Loud, and, and Nourish DC for um, helping our businesses because we need, we need it. All right. So if you want to learn how to open a business, um, well, I'm here to introduce a new portal that we are going to have at the DCSBDC website. Um, and it's going to launch on September 30th for Open Access DC. Now, I do recognize your names in the participants list, so I know that you've heard this before, but I'm just going to say it again for one, for people who are watching the recording that don't know about this. But um, the Aspen Int Institute's Food and Society team is going to transfer the Open Access DC portal to the DCSBDC site. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share with you the portal just so you know what it looks like. Um, and this is really important in what we're talking about today, actually, because today we're talking about how to open a food business in Washington, D.C. And the first step in, well, it's not the first, honestly, it's like the second step. The first step is to decide what it is that you're selling. But then once you decide what it is that you're selling, and you decide what your business operation is going to be like, then you have to write a business plan and you have to find out what your local regulations are so that you can actually open your business. And that's why Open Access DC is so great and so important. Um, Aspen Institute's been working on this for a while. I was very happy to be able to help them with my input. Granted that I you know, I think that their team was just so thorough that I didn't have that much to add, which is amazing, which also is if you are, if you do navigate this uh, portal and you do find yourself missing something, just communicate that with me because it is a developing portal, but it's already pretty great. And also we're going to launch it in DC first, and then it's going to launch in different major cities around the country. Open Access DC is a portal where you can find all of the information that you can use as a business owner to help guide you in opening your business. So the first part of it that's my favorite part is the fact that it categorizes different types of food businesses into sections that are comprehensive. So you have a restaurant cafe, a caterer, a food truck, and a private label. The reason this is so important is because no food business is cookie cutter. There is no food business that is the same as the other. There really is not. 
um, people just have very unique ideas. And the cool thing about food businesses is that you can have like a quasi business of like, you know, you do, you have a restaurant, but then you do catering or you have a restaurant, but you also do your private label um, sauce and you, and you package and distribute your own, your own product, or you have a catering company, but then you also have a food truck component or vice versa. So there's always something different with the food industry and you need to know what licenses you need in order to make this happen for yourself. So if you don't know what licenses you need and you're having trouble with that, ask for technical assistance because Nourish DC has technical assistance. Um, they have counselors that can help you through. Uh, so does the DC SBDC. So do we at Dreaming Out Loud. And Food Biz Mentor is here to let you know about all of those different technical assistance that you have for free because, um, because our, we're trying to be dot connectors over here to help you with those free resources to strengthen your food business. So when you click on one of these, um, then you will find a list, a comprehensive list of what you need to know before you venture into opening your food business. So I'm clicked on restaurants because restaurants is the most common um, type of food business that I get asked to help open. I think maybe one, because I'm a chef. So they think chefs, restaurants um, go hand in hand. However, chefs are uh, food managers. So chefs, we work with many different types of food businesses. It's not just restaurants, but restaurants are the ones that, that most people want to open. So I'll start with this one and just kind of show you what it's about. So if you wanna open a restaurant, you know you're gonna to have to negotiate a lease. So Open Access DC tells you about what it takes and how, you know, what, what things you need to look out for. And it also takes you through compliance and what inspections you need um, and what, yeah, really what's what, what, what expense, what expense, oh my gosh, I can't say it. What inspections? So the inspections, you get inspected by inspectors to make sure that you get the, um, the business licenses. Uh, catering has a really cool checklist as well. And you have a, a link to how to apply for a catering license and how to apply for alcoholic beverage license. Uh, food trucks, food trucks have a lot to them as well. You need to have a vendor's license first before you apply for your mobile food license. So it tells you kind of what, what steps you need to do to be able to open your business. And then also um, it gives you ideas or reminds you that, you know, you need to be able to make sure that you're thinking about how you're gonna attract customers or you need to be able to um, think about what types of, food truck concepts work in different areas? You know, do you have a common cuisine or is it a niche? Um, I, so I like the questions that Open Access DC portal asks you about, about what it is that you're looking to open. And then private label. I did notice that one of you was in my um, webinar this morning about private labels. Private labels are its own world. It is a, it's a whole nother world of food type businesses. Um, this is a wonderful um, type of business that allows you to scale your business in a way that doesn't always necessarily require that much more labor. So if you're a restaurant or a caterer or a food truck and you wanna create a different form of revenue, private labels are a really great way to do it. And if you do not want to do a private label and you're a restaurant and um, whatever, and one of those other businesses that are really kind of stagnant or, or in a brick and mortar, just remember that you're a little bit limited by the amount of turnover that you're gonna be able to have at your restaurant, meaning you're gonna be limited by the amount of people you're able to serve from a certain location. So thinking about how you can diversify your business and open up new streams of revenue is so important. And that's why I always encourage business plans because sometimes you think that you're gonna make a lot of money out of your restaurant and then you start doing the financial forecasts. And in the financial forecasts, you realize that you needed to have different 
other, other forms of revenue streams to support your business. So here in the Open Access DC portal that it's going to launch on the 30th of this month of September, you'll also be able to find resources on how to write a business plan, um, how to get some startup financing. Um, so this is a really cool portal. I just wanted to share it with you. I know that some of you have seen it already, um, but we're also just promoting it right now to let everyone know what's, as soon as it launches. So that's why I really went really deep into that. Um, and I am curious, just because we have a few people here today, um, if you could write in the chat, what type of food business do you have? Um, that would help me a little bit in in or you know in understanding how you want to open your food business. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But what kind of product do you want to sell, or do you want to open a food truck? Um, what kind of food business are you looking to open? So when you think about what kind of food business that you are looking to open, uh, there are a few things that I I always say that you need to think about first. So, all right, the most important part of how to start a food business is starting with the end in mind, meaning you might not know exactly where you're going to go in your food business. You might not know exactly where it's going to grow to become. And the reason I say you might not know is because I've never seen a business plan that once it's executed, that the business plan looks exactly like the business or the, the business looks exactly like the business plan. Typically, when after you write the business plan, your business evolves into whatever the consumer has kind of influenced it to become. The market will kind of mold your business in a way, uh, which is really necessary and important in being able to, to have it create a, um, an entity that will fit a demand because any business is where you have a demand and you, you identify the demand and then you supply that demand. So that is really the, the, the essence of writing a, a business one. Oh, you can't write in the chat. That's weird. If you can't write in the chat, how come I can read it? I don't know. Um, I guess I have to do it in the Q&A section then. So if you can't do it in the chat, if you can't write what, um, what type of business you have in the chat, then write it in the Q&A because I don't know why you can't write it in the chat, but I read it in the Q&A. So just right there, maybe, um, what is the type of product you would like to open? Okay, healthy snacks, love healthy snacks. Um, so healthy snacks, for example, that is a really great type of food business because who doesn't love a healthy snack? I mean, I don't know who doesn't love a healthy snack. And when you are developing your healthy snacks business or your restaurant, the first thing you need to start with is a vision. So this is when I really recommend that you take one of the visioning workshops that we do, especially with Jennifer Underwood. I like to, to have those. This, um, this webinar series does not have a visioning workshop, but I am going to talk about it today. Um, and if you are interested in a visioning workshop, just email me so I can send you when exactly we do these, or you can even go ahead and book uh, directly with, um, with Jennifer. Uh, Pablo wants a deli. Oh, I love delis. I used to have a deli. I had a deli for seven years and it was like my baby. I loved my deli. And, and I think it's a soul filling business. And I recommend that you watch the movie. Um, it's a documentary called The Deli Man. Um, I was a deli woman, but The Deli Man is very cool. And it teaches you a lot about the life of a deli person. But you know what I will say? I will say that be, having a deli 
people think that you really have to overwork yourself and not have a personal life and just be completely devoted to your deli. But really, you have to think about your personal health as you open your food business. So this is actually a good point uh, for this second point that I'm asking people to think about is can you delegate this? Something like a deli is busy a lot. So it's going all the time. You need people there. It's very labor heavy. You know, you need humans creating the sandwiches, packaging packaging them. Um, and so when you do things like that, you know, just make sure that you're creating a really, really solid system with standard operating procedures for your employees. So that brings me to the second point is, can you delegate this? Because I ask that because when you start a food business, it means that you're the entrepreneur, you're the business owner. And what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur is that you are the person that decided to take on the risk and the responsibility to be able to create this business and, and launch it. But you're taking the risk because every business has a risk. Otherwise, everyone would be in business. And I'd like to think of that in a very positive way. Uh, sometimes it makes people very scared or nervous, and that's why they don't end up opening their businesses. But I think that when you're creating a business, you, you have the power to do research, to look at data, and to set something up that mitigates your risk. So you will always have risk no matter what decision you need to make. And as a business owner, you have to be a solid decision maker. You have to be someone who is very effective and clear and, and you make the decision. It doesn't always have to be quickly. You know, sometimes you have decisions that you need to let them simmer a little bit in your brain before you take action. Um, but you always are the person who takes on the risk. And I always tell people, you have, um, you might have like five different scenarios and then do your research to figure out what's the best route to take. And then you find the uh, risk with the less risk. You know, you find the one that you find that, that you're comfortable with and that's the risk you take. So as an entrepreneur, you're really going for it. And that's why, um, especially in Washington, D.C., they like to support entrepreneurs because they know you're taking on risk. So what you need is really help and money and resources to be able to, to, to help launch you into that next level. So my question is to you, um, what do you want, right? So when you decide what you want, write it down because that's what your vision is. Um, we have here also a Jamaican food truck and want to make it into frozen foods to distribute to stores. So Maxine, um, that one, for the frozen food, I just did a class on that um, like an hour ago with the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. But we are going to talk about um, how about products and distributable goods here in this webinar series. So just make sure that, and actually, I just am going to repeat this again. If you have not uh, signed up, in our Eventbrite link. If you signed up using that because you received an email from me, please don't forget to follow the link of the Eventbrite. Um, it looks like it was already sent to everyone in the chat. Um, and the Eventbrite link is going to show you all of the upcoming classes that we have coming up for this incubator. So I'm going to share my screen to show you, but you have the Eventbrite link on the chat. Um, but what we're going to do is we, we're starting with how do you start a food business? Um, and then we're going to talk tomorrow about developing your proof of concept. We're going to talk about research and development, hiring and training. And then this one, Maxine, working with the manufacturer. That one's very important for your frozen food business. Um, and then also for the healthy snacks business we have here. And then at the end, we're going to talk about approaching your investors. So this is the whole series that we're going to have with the full schedule. Don't forget to sign up for this or register in the Eventbrite link. And the Eventbrite link is in 
the chat here today. So while I'm talking, just highlight it, copy it. And if um, you end up losing it, just let me know via email and then I'll send it back out to you. Um, so actually this, I would like to challenge also, not challenge, but point out that when I had the deli, one big reason it was so successful financially was because I had distribute food to distribute, uh, a distributable good. We made we made salamis and we sent it out to different factory or to different um, companies. We worked with wineries to make salamis with their wine, um, and we sold to Italy. So selling wholesale was a really big important part of the revenue stream of the deli. Uh, the sandwiches did very well. Um, and the deli part of it was actually one of the most profitable parts of it, but it was also one of the most labor intensive parts of it. So when you're strategizing your food business, I do definitely recommend to diversify what do you carry. Um, there's one really, I think you're all familiar with the local, um, with the local uh, deli called Parkway Deli. Parkway Deli is great because it has a whole grocery store before you even go in to sit down and get the deli food. Um, and that just makes for a very effective business. And then they also have standardized operating procedures on how they do um, all the dishes, all the pickups. So whenever you're thinking about how you're going to develop your food business, um, I got, uh, sorry, whenever you're thinking about how you're going to develop your food business, think about the, I mean, the most important part, the most important part of developing a food business is, um, is money, right? Because it's a business. So this is why I always say that the, um, that the business plan is the most important tool that you have. And when you're writing a business plan, the first step is, um, the first step that, sorry, I can't, I'm such a bad multitasker. I'm trying to copy paste, um, the, um, this Eventbrite link to the question and answer, but it doesn't allow me to. So I'm actually going to put it in the chat again, and hopefully you get this one. Cause I had someone say they don't have the Eventbrite link. So I put the Eventbrite link in the chat, please, uh, sign up for this through there so that we can have your registration so that you can have all that, all of the classes in one place so that you can go to ones that, that you're interested in. But I honestly think that all of them apply to everybody. Um, so when you're developing your business plan, you need to think about your vision. That's where it first begins. Um, this is why we do visioning workshops. So the, again, I will invite you all to those visioning workshops whenever we do them. And if you want to do a one-on-one -on -one visioning workshop, we can definitely do that through technical assistance. And basically a visioning workshop is where we're able to kind of have a conversation and think through what you really want so that you can write it down. And writing it down is a very essential part of starting your food business because it's where you solidify and start seeing, okay, this is how I'm gonna put my food business together. And that's very important because then you're gonna write your plan and you're gonna see if that business is viable. The, um, so that's why I say start with the end in mind. Write your business plan for what you want it to become, not what it is. It's what you want it to become because that's what you're going to try to get funding for so you can make that happen. So that's a very important thing that I see a lot of small businesses actually. Um, the so A lot of small businesses really make that mistake. They write their business plan for what it is and it's starting small. So it's, you're only going to write for what it is. So it means that you're not preparing yourself for what it's going to become. And you really need to create that path for yourself, like that road, so that you can have milestones that are achievable milestones. Um, and then, yes, uh, Pablo, my the best thing about the deli was not only the camaraderie of the team, but it really was waking up every day and writing welcome on the door and opening the door and then having the same customers there every day. The most beautiful part about a deli is the regulars. 
It really is like, because regu- delis are like the, the neighborhood spot, you know, delis are a place someone can eat every day there. And if you become this neighborhood spot, and if you're able to do it, I know that by the end of the seven years, 98% of our customers were regular customers, which is insane for Washington, D.C., where we have so much just sit at the people of Washington, D.C. come and go and come and go. Uh, like every three years, there it's a new batch of people because of new administrations. Do, um, and to become that neighborhood spot was one of the most special things that I've ever felt um, because you feel so integrated in the community. So a deli can be a beautiful thing, um, but there is that documentary called The Deli Man that explains the hardships of being a deli owner. And I am the person that says, I don't like to accept that things are gonna be so difficult. I like to think outside the box and figure out what do I need to do to make it so I can live my passion and make it work financially. And that's why a business plan is the most important document that you can have. And then when you want to apply for these grants, such as this Nourish DC grant, that they're awarding between 10 to $50,000 to our small businesses. And the grant pool for this year is $500,000. I mean, they're putting $500,000 into our small businesses this year. That is a big deal, but they're not going to do it if you don't have a solid business plan because somebody else who does have a plan can get that money. And really, when you're applying for business funding, the, the lender or the grantee or the grantor and all of them are thinking, is this business viable? Am I doing the person a, a favor? Am I, and I, am I doing them good by awarding them with this grant? Or am I doing them a disservice because they just don't have a plan? So sometimes more money doesn't mean better situation. Sometimes it can be a lot harder to manage. So having a business plan is the most important thing that you can have. And hopefully by the end of all of these workshops, you'll have the idea of how you're gonna put your business plan together. And when you're looking to put your business plan together, uh, that's why you have me and other counselors to help you through technical assistance in developing that business plan. And one of the most important parts of a business plan is asking yourself, can I delegate? can I set this up so I can have the right amount of labor and the right positions to meet all of the pieces of my puzzle of executing my business? Uh, So delegating as a business owner is the most important skill that you can develop because you can't do everything yourself. You're one human being. And that one human being is responsible for all of the administration and all of the production and all of the sales and all of the marketing. So your job as a business owner is really to look at the big picture. So I always tell everyone, think about it like a body. Um, And then the, the money is the blood and all of the organs and pieces of the body are important and they all function together. But you're, you as the head, as a CEO, you are the the one that's leading the whole thing. You're the brain of it. And the reason is because it's your business. It's your business. So you need to know where you're going so that the rest of the people following you also know where they're going. Uh, If you don't know where you're going, it makes it very difficult to be a leader. And because of that, I like to recommend some books to help you through um, this discovery of how to be an effective leader. So one of my favorite books that I just uh, read recently is called Leaders Eat Last. Um, it is a, I'll write it in the chat, but it's um, by Simon Sinek. But Leaders Eat Last is a really cool book because especially for food businesses, a lot of our staff and our teams get motivated when we're clear, but then when we're also working with them and when we value our employees. Um, Food service businesses are heavily, heavily dependent, heavily dependent on our staff. Um, A chef is nothing without good cooks. 
It just is that you can't cook everything yourself. So you better have a good brigade. You have to have a good team. And the only way you can have a good team that cares and that's um, passionate and that sticks around is if you treat them well. And that is what brings me to this book. This book is called The Guide to Giving Great Service. And if you went to my webinar yesterday, you already saw this book and I'm gonna write it here on the chat as well. The Guide to Giving Great Service is a book that um, it helps you understand how to treat your employees so that they treat your, your guests or your customers with that same type of energy. Um, because service is one of the most important parts of the food industry. That's why a lot of the time they don't even call it the food industry. They call it the service industry um, because we are serving others. That's what we do as a career. And we are enjoy it. People who um, who are work in the food industry and in the service industry love serving others. It's something that we're proud of. But how do you do it in a way that um, is effective, in a way that you don't get um, taken advantage of, and in a way that um, you feel that fulfillment, that you're making money, you're making sales, but you have a great energy around your business. So this book, Guide to Giving Great Service, is actually excellent. And for you, Pablo, who wants to open a deli, super important because this is uh, written by Ari, uh, I can't even pronounce his last name, Weinswig, but Hans Zingerman's Delicatessen in, um, in Michigan, in Ann Arbor, one of the most important delis in all of the country. Um, and he did it really looking at um, how to treat other people within his company. So these are two really important books that I recommend as you're developing your business, because they're going to exercise things that I believe, because this is my recommendation, right? In my years of experience, I believe that you need to treat people well and that you need to lead effectively by being a servant leader. And a, being a servant leader does not mean that you're overworking yourself and you're the one doing all the work. Being a servant leader just means that you treat people with respect and that you're, you're effectively guiding the path. So these two books will help you with that. Um, so then we talk about the next stuff, which is kind of the, the more technical things. Um, which is your business planning and your funding. You need to have a business plan to know where you're going and to set it up. And then you need to figure out how you're gonna pay for that because you always need money to do it. And one lesson that I do like to mention is, um, I remember once somebody told me that, you don't, that someone had advised her not to ever put her own money into her business. And I will say, that the food business is one of the best businesses to start in a grassroots level. You can really accumulate sales if you just manage your inventory and your marketing effectively. And you don't always need loans and grants. If you, if you have not qualified one, it shouldn't squash or squash your, um, your dreams <laughs> or your goals. You should be able to self-fund as well. The grants and the loans are wonderful to add fuel so that you can create a bigger business more quickly because sometimes to gather the amount of information or, or money, sorry, to gather the amount of money it's going to take to fund something, it's going to take you a long time. So I always tell people about this little theory that it's um, being unconsciously incompetent. Uh, there's a lesson that I learned along the way that uh, somebody told me it's better to be consciously incompetent, which means it's better to consciously know that you don't know something than to be unconsciously incompetent, which means that you don't know that you don't know something. So this is why counseling and technical assistance through all of these different organizations like Dreaming Out Loud is so important because as you navigate this world of business, you realize that food it's really only about 2% of all of the other things that as a business owner, you are responsible for. So it's better to know that you don't know 
so that we can you can ask and we can help you with literally anything. If you need marketing, branding help, uh, business planning help, I'm the chef at um, all these organizations. So I'll help you with the technical stuff in operations, recipe development, um, even front of house setup or, or training. Um, and we have Yodid and other counselors who do all of the certifications and they're able to connect you with the grants and they're able to help you apply for the grants. So I didn't know that all that existed when I opened the, the deli back in the day, right? That's why I started Food Biz Mentor uh, because I want people to know about this stuff. That's my whole, whole mission right now or forever. But you, when you open your food business, you need to know that, that you have resources available. And then you need to manage consistency. You have to be reliable. If you are not consistently reliable, if your food quality is not consistent, you're not going to make it. And the reason is because you're going to disappoint your customers. And the whole point of, of growing a food business is really to snowball your following and snowball your sales. Meaning you start with one person, that person tells their friends, they buy it. Those people tell their friends, they buy it. And that word of mouth is the most important and most effective form of marketing and food that there is. You still do commercials, you still do social media, you do all those other ways of outreach to find customers, but it's nothing if you let your customers down once they actually try the food. So the consistency and the quality is the most important part of how you're going to start your food business. So the way you manage your consistency is by developing standard operating procedures and recipes. So we will talk about that a little bit. And that actually leads me to my next part of this presentation, which is recipe development. So recipe development um, is a huge part of how to open your food business. And the reason it is so important, obviously, is because it's your product. We're talking how to open a food business here, right? And your food is going to have a recipe. So we, when you're developing your recipe, um, you're going to look at a lot of different factors. And I'm going to talk a little bit here about the tools that I use to develop my recipes that have helped me. Because next workshop that we're going to do um, tomorrow is about developing your proof of concept. So your proof of concept is going to be dependent on your recipe, right? So your proof of concept is, are you selling to customers? Do you currently have customers? Have you developed your product? And do you have a business plan to where you know where you're going to go and how you're going to strategize your growth? That's your proof of concept because you're showing the investor or the lender that you actually are getting sales. Because if you look at the criteria of this grant that I introduced to you today, you can see that it says that you must be generating revenue for more than six months. And you must have earned more than $10,000 of revenue in the past 12 months. So must have earned $10,000 of revenue is an achievable goal, right? There you have a milestone. So if you're looking to open your food business, you know, okay, I'm going to have to, for the next year, try to, to, to prove my concept so I can apply for this grant because this grant is gonna range from $10,000 to $50,000. So that's how you get your funding or your portion of funding through this grant. Because last year, they gave out $530,000. This year, they're giving out $500,000. So you have a goal, you have a milestone and you have a resource. So that's why you're here today at the Streaming Out Loud workshop is because we're trying to teach you how you can get that funding. But all of it starts with your product, right? So in your recipe development, you need to really be aware of the fact that you're not going to be able to produce all of your food yourself. The reason I say this is because I see a lot of business owners that think that they're going to be making the food themselves as they grow their businesses. 
And as much as I think that's beautiful, because I do, because I'm a chef and I love to cook, it's not sustainable. So when somebody is going to look at your business plan, they're going to make sure that you have a team of key players, because you are only one human. And one person cannot do everything. So just knowing that, understand that you have to allocate for that in your budget. You have to know that you're going to need a team. And that begins with your recipe development. Your recipe development has to be something that you dedicate time to. But once you do it, you made sure that you standardize the recipe so that the people making the food have it easy, basically. You're trying to make it so that they have more efficiency. And so you basically will kind of break break it down for them in a very easy way that they have achievable tasks and they execute the recipe. So I just said this this morning. Some of you saw it. I'm going to say it again. Keep it simple. Uh, menus should be kept simple. Um, and the reason that you want to keep your pickup simple is because you need a place that's going to make things quickly. So especially like something like a deli, and I'll say deli because I, I love delis and I had my deli. One of our greatest um, points of success in the deli was to make really delicious sandwich recipes that were very simple pickups. So the, the, the sandwich that was the most complicated was maybe had like five steps, which is our banh mi. Um, but there are things that might take longer than others to to make or to do the pickup of, but you need to you need to try to shut cut down the time on everything as far as for the food production. And the reason is because it yields a lot more efficiency. And the customers are happier because they're getting their food faster. Or if it's a snack company, the customers are happier because you're not spending so much money on labor that you can offer your product at an affordable price for them or some a price that's more um, accessible at the least. Um, and then for frozen foods, you're, the nice thing if you're going into, if you're catering and then you're going into the frozen food side, keeping it simple is super important because you're gonna have to work with a co-packer and they're not gonna be able to have everything under the sun in their inventory. And that's gonna save you a lot of money and um, a lot of money and a lot of stress. So keeping it simple is very important. Um, how do you keep it simple? Um, that's where technical assistance is required. So that's why I always tell you, you have access to free counseling, free technical assistance. And that's so important because this is not something that I can teach in a workshop for everybody because everyone's very unique. So when you're looking to, to simplify your production, um, schedule technical assistance time or speak with an experienced person in that realm uh, or in that field so that they can help you. Um, one little tip in developing recipes that I like to include uh, always is the flavor Bible. The flavor Bible is very cool for recipe development because it opens your eyes to what flavors might help make your product a little bit more special. Um, when you're developing recipes, the having a different, especially right now with trends, different flavor combinations is actually very fun to play with. And I think that it's becoming um, a lot, I don't wanna say expected, but it's very well received by consumers. People really love trying new things. Um, but they need that thing to have a point of reference. They need to have a connection with that, even if it's a if it's a, a different flavor combination. For example, with the deli, all of the sandwiches had a point of reference: a pastrami sandwich, a roast beef sandwich, a pulled pork sandwich, a chili, a ham and cheese sandwich, a club sandwich. Everything was a normal sandwich. But then the flavors or the the way it was made was what gave people that, oh, wow, I've never had this pulled pork sandwich with this type of bread before. Or, oh, this is. So that's the type of stuff that makes it like them. Oh, wow, that's cool. 
So when you're developing your recipes for a restaurant or a place where you want it to become trendy, working on those recipes um, and, and opening your eyes a little bit and thinking outside the box, I think it has served me well. Um, being traditional has also served me well. So it's not like if you're traditional, you're doing a bad thing. But if you're being very traditional, that quality of your food needs to be spectacular because that person has tasted that food multiple times. So that's you, you really need to be spectacular so you can get that repeated sale. So how do you do that? Um, you standardize your operations and you make sure that you're um, being consistent with your quality and with your service. So this is going to be something that is uh, very useful for people who want to switch it up a little bit with their flavor profiles. And if you need help with uh, doing that, schedule technical assistance time and I'll be able to help you. I said this earlier, but I think a few of you weren't here. Um, I was in New York this week uh, in LA. Uh, so that's why I haven't been able to be as responsive as I usually am via email. But now I'm back. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I'm going to a wedding in October for a few days, but that's it. So schedule your technical assistance time because I'm I'm available. Um, and then so are other, other counselors. So you just need to let us know about two weeks in advance so we can fit you in. Um, it's not about fitting you in as much as there's a lot of other people that also need technical assistance. So let us know about two weeks ahead. Um, next, I'm gonna show you um, Grant Ackett's and how he does flavor balancing. Uh, the reason I'm gonna show you this is because I think it's uh, super cool. If you're looking to open a food business and you want to kind of understand how you're going to come up with a different uh, flavor profile or a different idea. This is an exercise that helps me get out of my creative ruts. So when I'm, I'm designing a menu, uh, I do, I am very traditional in my cooking, but sometimes I want to try something new um, and I don't want to, I, I want it to make sense and I want it to uh, work with the, the, I want the flavor profiles to combine very well. And so when I'm developing a food product and I'm thinking, how am I going to make this make sense? I do this exercise. And a little bit about Grant Ackett's is that this chef is one of the best chefs in the world. He really was the top chef in the United States for a very long time. He had a restaurant uh, named Alinea or has uh, the, avi the aviary, which is a cocktail, cool cocktail place in Chicago. Um, and he had the concept next, which where he took uh, old menus from like the Middle Ages, and then he sold tickets and would make the menu of the Middle Ages, but modernized. And that was pretty cool, too. Uh, so Grant Ackett is very, in, he's, he's an innovator. He's very creative. Uh, and he's from Ohio. He's from Ohio and grew up in a normal American household where he was eating normal American foods. And when he became a chef, he just, he wanted to use his imagination and do things completely differently. So I really value that of him. And I think that that's great. And something I value even more about Grant Ackett's is that when he hit his peak um, in the beginning of his career, uh, where people were talking about his food, they were writing about him, he ended up getting cancer on his tongue. So he lost the sense of taste. So here he is a chef who worked really, really hard to get to where he was, still in charge of developing the menu at Alinea, and he couldn't taste anything. <laughs> and that sucks because I taste everything because when you're doing this stuff, you need to taste along the way. So he came up with a very practical method in which he thinks about how he's gonna put flavors together that he didn't need his sense of taste. He was already able to take a look to see that they combined. And then other people would make sure that it tasted good. He would ask and everything, but it's just impressive that he's able to come up with these things even without the sense of taste as a chef, which is like our most important sense. Um, so I will push play so you can take a look at what he did with flavor bouncing. And then I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. Okay. 
basically, the way this works is if you have your focal ingredient in the middle, let's say it's white beans, you're trying to build a dish around that. So, typically how I start is I'll say the first thing that comes to mind, I'll say something like bacon, right? Well, I know bacon or any type of pork product, pancetta, uh, ham, they all go with white beans, right? So then I'll go, okay, well what goes with bacon? That also goes with white beans. So maybe I'll say apple or pear. So apple and pear go with bacon, they also go with white beans. So now the next one that enters the equation, say it's maple syrup. Now maple syrup needs to go with white beans, which it does. It needs to go with apples, which it does. And it needs to go with bacon or pan or ham, which it does. So you keep building this kind of system, what we call bouncing flavors. So basically, you just keep going. Uh, let's throw an oddball one in there. Um, beer, right? So this Guinness go with white beans. Sure, everybody drinks beer with their pork and beans, right? Does beer go with maple syrup? Absolutely, they make some beer with maple syrup. Does beer go with apples? Well, of course, you can drink beer with apples. And does beer go with bacon? Well, everything goes with bacon. So, of course, beer goes with bacon. So you keep going like this, and you build, you build the flavors this way, and you just keep bouncing them off each other. Beer and almonds? Yeah, when you're sitting at the bar, you eat salted almonds. Almonds with bacon? Sure. The only rule to this is that, starting with the focal ingredient, whatever supporting component that you put in the puzzle has to go with every other one. Let's say instead of beer, we would have went with red wine. Okay, I can see red wine going with beans. I can't really see red wine going with maple syrup. Red wine could go with apples, red wine certainly goes with pork products, and red wine could go with almonds, but it doesn't go with the maple syrup, so it can't be in the equation. And that's why we went with beer, as long as they follow the rule. All right, so a cool thing, actually I'm going to go back a little bit so you can see his dish. Um, there we go. So. Oh man, what's going on? Okay. <laughs> so you can see his dish here. Something that I think is so cool about Grand Ackett's is that all of his flavors have a point of reference. Um, it's innovative combinations. And he changes the the he plays around with the textures and the way he creates or he imparts those flavors into dishes. So he might, um, you know, you could see that he did a Guinness foam, a vanilla gel, um, a pancetta chip. Uh, so he he changes the way of he the, in which he presents the ingredients or incorporates it into the dish that is a little bit different than what somebody's already tried. But the flavors. Um, always have a point of reference. And so that does uh, bring me to the fact that the the most important thing that I hope you get out of, or not the most important thing, but one of the important things that I hope you get about today is that you know that when you're developing a dish, you need to have a point of reference. Or when you're developing a food concept, you need to give your customers a point of reference because that point of reference connects nostalgia. And when you are able to connect an, an emotional component with the practical thing, um, that's what gets you more customers. So when you're opening your food business, think, okay, what type of food business do I want? And how am I gonna connect it to customers? And the reason is because your customers are gonna spend money with you and they're your fuel. 
And I have seen really beautiful, amazing um, concepts fail. And the reason I've seen them fail is because they didn't give the customers a point of reference. So as, as unique and beautiful as the idea might be, um, if you're not going to give your customers a point of reference, you better have a lot of money saved up because you're going to need that for marketing. You're going to need that for branding because you're going to need to educate the customer as to why they need to spend money with you. So that's why I really like Grant Ackett's is, is his strategy. And trust me, I have seen chefs open restaurants that are really innovative and they don't do well financially because they're not tying a point of reference. So, you know, how to open a food business is the title of today's presentation. And it goes into, we're going to go into the following workshops more in depth in different subject matters, but how to open a food business is you are a, an individual who has a vision who's passionate about that vision and you're able to systematize it and you're able to produce the food so that customers purchase it. But when customers go to purchase it, they have to understand it so that they spend money with you. And if they purchase it, it has to be high quality. You have to do a good job about being consistent because if you're not consistent, then they're going to be let down, then they're not going to come back. Um, so yesterday I was, a few of you were at my workshop yesterday where I was talking about Aristotle and the three pillars of how to become an influential person. Um, and that's a very important thought process behind developing a business, which is that you have your business vision or your mission, and that's going to be something that you're going to have to strengthen that reputation and be consistent so that you can maintain that reputation. Then you have the pathos, which is where you connect with the customer in identifying the need that they have so that you can fill it and relate it to what you're selling. And then you have the um, ethos, pathos, and the logos. And the logos is where they can identify you from afar. They know where you are. And they know where you are because of your branding, because you 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 developed a good brand, you marketed it, and you have a good logo, something that they can identify. So another book that I'm going to recommend for people who are looking to start their food business is this book. It's a very classic book. Um, it's I think it was, it was written in like 1930 or something, um, but it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. This is one of the most important books I ever I ever read. I am one of the people who I like to um, identify with people anyway when I'm speaking to them like because I care. But that book uh, just kind of, so puts it into business terms as far as um, uh, how to make that connection when you have only a couple of minutes with somebody? How are you going to identify the need so that you can sell them your product? And so that's a really, really good book. I'm going to put it in the chat so you have it. And then also, um, hopefully what we'll do or what we're going to do is create a little portal so that you can have a place to find all of these uh, books that I recommend through um, through the through the, all the workshops because I recommend so many. Um, and the reason I recommend so many is because that's the way even I learn. And I think everyone can kind of agree with that, that the more you read, um, the more you exercise your brain, the more you learn and the more you grow. You, um, so I always like to think about myself as like an information sponge and I take what I like and uh, what I don't like, well, maybe I don't apply it, but uh, this is more geared toward everything that I, I know so that you're getting those, um, those recommendations. I love, I love who moved my cheese. I have who moved my cheese, who moved my cheese, Pablo is Sorry, I'm going to put this into context for people who can't read the chat. But <laughs> so Pablo said that he likes who moved my cheese and who moved my cheese is super important. And it was the most important book during the pandemic. Um, I 
you know, my job is to help lots of businesses. And, and with the DCS, BDC, I helped thousands of businesses. But the ones that didn't survive were the ones who didn't move, go with the movement of the cheese, you know, like what move, who moved my cheese is just talking about how you're going to um, adjust with different situations that come at you through uh, through life and, and business. And you really need to work sometimes with what happens and make the most of it and, and figure out how you might ident identify that pivot that you might need to make as a business. So that's very important. And as a food business owner, um, we are in a very fluctuating industry. So you do want to be very clear about what you want, but then also understand that sometimes different factors will challenge you. And it's in how you take on that challenge that and you adjust with that challenge that you thrive. Um, so the pandemic was really a wonderful, not wonderful, but a really interesting time to be able to exercise that pivoting skill that you have to have as a food business owner. Um, there are a few other breeding materials that I love that apply to this that I'm not going to share today, but I'm going to share them along the way in the webinars so that you can start gathering a really cool reading list. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes left, and I, I hope that you all got the Eventbrite link that I sent over. Now I'm just going to share with you a few tools that you can use to write your business plan. So there is another book that's called Lean Business Planning. I can't even. Like, okay, next time I'm not using the space background, so <laughs> but Lean Business Planning. Um, this is by Tim Barry. It's another very excellent book about how to write a business plan in a very concise, clear, and short way. Um, investors want a comprehensive business plan that's not too long, that looks interesting, that's invite, like, you know, it's it's inviting, it's very interesting, and the, that the financials make complete sense. And when I say they make complete sense, just remember that the investor worked hard for their money. So they're going to put their money in your hands, expecting that it's going to give them a, a profit. So because of that, um, you need to exercise that and have a very thorough, well thought out business plan. Uh, there's another, there's a podcast that I love to listen to called How I Built This by Guy Raz. And How I Built This, it was very inspiring for me, especially when I had the deli and I felt sometimes a little, a little, a little alone. You know, sometimes as a business owner, you feel very lonely when you're going through certain things by yourself that nobody else knows about. That's another reason I, I became a, a, a what I do now with technical assistance because I, I've been there and I know how it, it can feel to want to talk through something with somebody as you navigate your thoughts. Um, but How I Built This was one of the best podcasts I could have come across because Guy Roth asks uh, business owners what their challenges were as they were growing their very successful businesses. Um, and when, so I'm going to write that in the chat, but one of the things that is a very common uh, thread through all the businesses that are in how I built this is the fact that they started their business one way and it became something else. And it became whatever it became because of customer demand. Um, so when you have a business plan that's very thorough, don't feel bad if you're if it's not exactly the same as if, if your business isn't exactly the same as what you wanted in your business plan. It's something to really embrace, in my opinion, um, because it helps aid your your growth. Um, but you need to have a business plan. And clearly, I said this that if you're if you're to take anything from the lessons today, it's please write your own business plan don't hire someone to write your business plan for you. And the reason I say that is um, you should, you have free technical assistance to guide you into what even the SBA looks for because we're SBA funded and a lot of these, uh, a lot in a lot of these programs. 
um, and you have experts around you to help you, but you as the business owner need to put your business plan on paper and you need to do the numbers. You have to find out what everything will cost you and it's your job to do it. And the reason it's your job to do it and the reason no one can do it except you is because you're the one that needs to come across the hurdles and the, the and navigate those things so that you can learn what options you have out there for yourself. Um, and there's not a, a bigger disservice than someone can do for someone else than to write their business plan for them. And if you feel stuck in writing your business plan, schedule technical assistance time because that's what we're here to do. We're here to counsel you through and help you so that you can develop your business plan and, and actually achieve it and have a great business plan that you can then get a grant or you can get an investor. So Lean Business Planning by Tim Barry is an excellent book. If you're stuck in writing a business plan, buy it. It's on Amazon for like seven bucks. It's not even expensive. And it takes you through every reasoning behind all the points that you need for a good, solid business plan. So this is an excellent book. Um, there are also other programs that I'll introduce along the way for business plan writing, but that book is really great. And then if you're looking for funding, another book, the last book I'm going to recommend today, and then I'll wrap it up and, and let you ask me questions, um, is this one, uh, Target Funding by Kedma O. Uh, Target Funding is a great book that'll help you understand different methods um, on how to raise capital because every business needs money. It's not a business if there's not money and you wanna profit on your, on your investments too. It's not just about having money, it's about keeping and growing the money. Um, and, and you know, that is, that's the hard part. It's very easy to spend money as a business. So you wanna make sure that uh, number one, you're careful with your accounting. And then number two, that, um, you're fueling your machine, right? You're gonna need funding and funding is what's gonna help your business grow. So I'm gonna put in this book, this um, or this, this chat, this book, it's called Target Funding by Kedma O. And it really helps you in understanding different um, methods on how to, oh, you GHO, yeah, on how to raise capital. Um, I remember for a while, um, it's crowdfunding websites were very popular. Crowdfunding is becoming way less effective these days, uh, only because we're dealing with world problems, COVID, inflation, things <laughs> that happen uh, in the world that affect people's um, disposable income. Uh, but as much as people help, I feel like they really do. Uh, but these are strategies aside from that that work really, really well. Um, and one of them is applying for grants. So don't forget the, um, the Nourish DC grant that I shared with you earlier, because that is um, a hugely important and super cool um, resource that you have now that we've been... Um, We've, we haven't had for a while here in DC. So I'm just gonna go back again here so you can take a look. I did put the links in the chat so you could access it, but don't forget that the grant, when the exact date is determined, will be posted on the Nourish website. Um, this is being funded by Capital One and Nourish DC. Uh, this is something that Dreaming Out Loud is, is helping you in. So that's why we're here today, is literally to help you be able to grow your business and um, make it happen. And this grant, they're going to put $500,000, $500,000 into our local businesses. So if you have an existing business, and these are the criteria, if you have an existing business and you have earned more than $10,000 of revenue in 12 months, and you're located in D.C., Preference will be for businesses located in Ward 5, 7, and 8. But if you're in other wards, you can still apply. And you need to be generating, generating revenue or have been generating revenue for the past six months. Some, those are fairly uh, basic criteria. 
and you can get between $10,000 to $50,000. Um, so if you need help in applying for this grant, let us know. We have counselors to help you with that. Um, all right, and now I'm just kind of taking a look at the chat. Oh, and then oh, I see. So I will, the, the podcast that I like, I'm going to put it in the chat too. It's how I built this. And then the uh, the speaker is Guy Roz, and that's an NPR podcast. Um, all right, so it's 4.26. Uh, this was scheduled until 4.30, so I feel like I gave you a lot of information um, with our limited time that we had here. So I'm going to stick around in case you have any other questions, um, but please be here tomorrow and uh, check out the Eventbrite link and sign up through there to see all of the next webinars that we have for this cohort coming up. And then if you want to know just in general what webinars I'm doing, follow me on social media. I use Instagram a ton. I update social media more than I update my website, uh, but I try to update my website as well as often as possible. But my social media is linked to my website. So you can find me um, at foodbizmentor.com. My business name is a website name. Um, and you can follow us at Dreaming Out Loud, uh, so D-O-L-B-C, at Food Biz Mentor, and at Chef underscore Carolina Gomez to get all of the latest information. I use Instagram a lot, so that's my main form of social media. Um, and thank you again to Capital One and Nourish DC and Dreaming Out Loud for making this whole um, webinar series happen. So. I will, I'm just going to answer some questions. And uh, if not, then I'm just going to stick around for the next couple of minutes. And hopefully I see you tomorrow. But thank you so much for coming. It was great seeing everybody. This format of webinar is funny because I can't see your faces. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, um, but yeah, it was great seeing you and thank you for participating today.